Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, dear friend, uh, Lungten Gyatsoji. Namaste, Lungten Ji. Welcome. Namaste, Ji. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste, Lungten Ji. Yeah. Namaskar, Ji. Namaskar, Sharmila Ji. And everybody. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Lungten Ji. Uh, just for the information of everyone, uh, presently he is the president of the College of Language and Culture Studies uh, in a place called Takse in Bhutan. It's on the uh, eastern side, central eastern side of Bhutan. He is also the pro vice chancellor of the Royal University of Bhutan. And he uh, is a very sought after Buddhist scholar. Uh, he travels all around the world uh, to give talks about Buddhism. Um, he's the executive faculty of the Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies, which is like our uh, uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy, uh, something like that. Executive faculty at the Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies, which is at Kunsling in Bhutan, which is on the east, eastern border, I mean, sorry, western side of Bhutan, uh, bordering India. Uh, he's also worked with the, <clears throat> the national language Zonka. He's an expert committee member of the Zonka Development Council. And uh, more recently, associate faculty at the Institute of Wellbeing, uh, which uh, uh, is in Shalune near Thimpu. So he has studied Buddhism, he has explored Buddhism, uh, he has co authored uh, a book called my, The Light of My Life, uh, which is an English Zonka dictionary. Also an English Zonka dictionary, sorry. He, this is a different book, The Light of My Life, an English Zonka dictionary and a Zonka English dictionary and many articles on philosophy. And since 2012, um, he has been exploring the universal human values. Uh, he has transcribed so many of these workshops word to word uh, it's quite really amazing, Lungtenji. Thank you for uh, sharing today. Welcome. Mm. Uh, namaskar, everybody. Uh, thank you, um, Rajulji uh, and uh, Sharmila Mamji for giving me this opportunity. Um, I would like to start my. Am I am I audible, Rajulji? Yes, yes, very much audible. Okay. Nice, okay. audible. Yeah. Uh, um, I would like to start my sharing with uh, deep uh, respect and gratitude to the entire UHP Sangha, led by our most respected Guruji uh, Ganeshji. As uh, Rajulji said, uh, I came across UHP in 2012 and attended my first workshop in Triple IT Hyderabad. Ever since, I had the opportunity to attend several workshops, both in India, in, in different places in India, uh, besides Kanpur, and also in Bhutan under the guidance of our you know, uh, distinguished mentor, Ganeshji supported by Rajulji, Kumar Sambhavji, Sharmilaji, and many others, you know, had wonderful opportunity uh, to, to listen to uh, them. And uh, my encounter with UHP was a very pleasant and affirmative uh, one, as it was very much in alignment with what I have studied and wished to explore. In fact, um, UHP, UHP gave me the tools to explore within in a more scientific and systematic manner. And it actually gave me the legs to walk the talk that are captured in the books and literature um, that are uh, sometimes very compressed and enigmatic in nature. If you look at the tradition and the literatures, um, 
with the UHP tools, today I'm able to scan and skim through the different darshans, uh, different darshans, uh, particularly in Buddhist literature, um, the Buddhist literature and um, other uh, darshanas that I'm aware of, such as the Sankhya and Nyaya darshana. Uh, because I studied Sanskrit literature and I developed, um, you know, keen interest in studying some of the Indian darshanas, and I took uh, keen interest in Sankhya and Nyaya darshana. Um, and my vipassana practice has also been enhanced and enriched by many folds because of UHP. Um, because UHP gives the fundamental worldview and the tool that sits well with any darshana because it is seeking the absolute truth that which is the fundamental and quintessential aspect of every tradition. In particular, the morning exercise exercises, you know, these exercises one and two have been very affirming and assuring in understanding our deep rooted sanskars, uh, which are normally you know, buried deep down underneath our seemingly unquestionable preconditioning and strong assumptions that we have accumulated over many lifetimes unconsciously. But the UHP tools with which we are now able to go beyond our preconditioning and gross assumptions that which ultimately trigger the interplays of aversion and hatred all the time. Now with exercises one and two, you know, we are able to locate and see our scars, even in its subtle form. Of course, it depends where we as explorers um, stand in the journey of our exploration, but we are at the least able to identify our deep-rooted sanskars that is at the base of our desire, thought, and expectation, and how they drive our desire, thought, and you know, um, uh, expectations and imaginations all the time. Of the, you know, 7.5 billion people in the world, it's perhaps only less than, uh, not even 1%, you know, maybe point something, one less than uh, point something percentage of the total human population that is able to see that self is central to human existence, not, you know, more than 99.9% .9 of the world population doesn't see that self is central to human existence. Um, because more than 99% of the total human beings are educated to seek happiness and well-being from outside, which is out and out materialistic. Conventional education, therefore, you know, this education system has only reinforced two of our fundamental gross assumptions. One is that my happiness is outside. This is what education has fundamentally, you know, um, taught us, and the other is that I am fundamentally the body. But if you look at our different traditions and darshanas, they have been all the time telling us that our true happiness is within and not without, which now that the UHB has been very handy and eye-opening in terms of our self-exploration, and in terms of unlocking and decoding the enig enigmatic uh, um, wisdom that are embedded and captured in our traditions in the form of teachings, both oral and scriptures for thousands of years. So through UHP, the unlocking and decoding of the enigmatic wisdom is possible simply because the tools that UHP employ are scientific, rational, logical, universal, verifiable, and ultimately leading to harmony and most importantly, the UHB approach is purely first person based inquiry, uh, not uh, you know, based on belief. And it's guided by our natural acceptance, which is again, universal, invariant, innate, and definite in nature. Natural acceptance, in fact, is the primordial consciousness, which is uncorrupted, unadulterated, and pristine. And, um, it is uh, our natural acceptance that connects us to the pure observer. In fact, natural acceptance uh, in Buddhism 
is, you know, what we refer to as the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature is the innate presence of that pure observer that's sitting in all of us. It is the pure conscience with which we can guide ourselves on the path of our self-exploration. And I think, you know, I would like to say that this natural acceptance is the connecting dot between humans and divinity with which we can access the pure observer on our own without you know, any external support. If we pay attention, then this uh, you know, natural acceptance can connect us to, to divinity. So natural acceptance is the handle with which we can have a firm grip onto our inner journey. It is only through our natural acceptance that human beings can initiate transformation in, in, in holistic terms as a composite phenomenon, uh, mentally, emotionally, intellectually, psychologically, and spiritually. Now, if I may share my understanding with regards to exercises one and two, um, with exercise one, we are working with the self. What is common to all of us, to all the self, is the aspiration to be happy and prosperous. I think that's an innate quality. Uh, we, know, we now know that for happiness and prosperity, we need to ensure three fundamental things, uh, which is the crux of UHB, uh, which focuses on three fundamental things, right understanding in the self, right feelings and right thought in the self, and also develop the competence to live with uh, you know, right living with the world outside. Now, to understand any reality, um, again, this has been the focus of UHB, that we have to pay attention, observe whatever is to be understood. So, um, it has to begin with paying attention to the reality which, which I'm living, including my, my own self. Now the issue here is paying attention, paying attention, focus. And when we go to paying attention, then two important questions arise. One is what is the object of attention and what is the process of paying attention? Then again, the object of attention has to do with everything that relates to my life, that relates to my living, I have to understand that, I have to pay attention to it. So the object of attention is the whole existence, the whole existential reality. And the process of paying attention is being aware of the reality, which is, which is the most important uh, thing. Being aware of the reality that I want to understand and then evaluating that reality without reaction. So exercise one is to do with paying attention to the consciousness in it, the self. And exercise two has to do with paying attention to the interplays of the body and consciousness. And the major part of exercise two is again about the self. So the principal idea behind observing the self by the self in exercise one is that fundamentally by arranging material things around us at the most comfort and convenience will happen. Well-being does not happen by, by arranging material things outside. These physical things like clothes, you know, house, cars will set us up for a certain arrangement, outside arrangement, but, will it, but it will not fix our feelings. If we do not fix our inner world, it does not matter how our outside arrangements are. We are still miserable, unhappy, and unfulfilled. But if our feelings are fixed, we can still be wonderful with bare minimum. Till now, we have been looking at the world outside and our major concern has been the physical facility, our body, sensations from the body, feelings coming from outside. Now, if we pay attention to the world outside and settle things within and then start paying attention to the world outside, then we will be able to relate to the world outside in a meaningful, fulfilling manner. And if I can do this, 
then I can set things right within first and then work in a mutually fulfilling manner with the world outside. This is the main, main purpose of, you know, doing exercise one. So in exercise one, we are observing the self by the self to begin with, with we are observing the imagination that is going on in the self, the feeling, the thought directly by the self every moment. We are trying to be aware of our imagination at this moment without any reaction. So whatever be the imagination, be it right or wrong, whatever be the feeling, the thought, whether it is right or wrong, I'm just observing. I'm not evaluating it. I'm just observing like being, you know, being you know, observing a traffic jam, for example. If you look at the traffic jam from above, and if you are not in the traffic jam, you enjoy the multicolored brake lights, especially during the night. But the moment you are in the traffic jam, the whole experience is completely different. You are agitated, irritated, honking, shouting. But if you are just observing from a distance, you enjoy. Similarly, you know, observation uh, of our thoughts and imaginations, if we observe from, you know, from a uh, from afar, and this is what, uh, you know, in, in tradition also we refer to the term, Sanskrit term or Hindi term, maybe tatast. So, um, um, so whatever be the imagination, be it right or wrong, whatever be the feeling, the thought, I'm just observing, I'm not evaluating it, I'm not trying to remove it or stop it, I'm not trying to change it, I'm just observing it. I'm just being aware of my imagination, particularly my feelings. And when we do that, because wrong feelings are not naturally acceptable, it evaporates. You just have to see it. You just have to locate it. You just have to identify those negativities, those feelings. The moment you see it, it's like putting on the light and the confusion, um, you know, disappears, evaporates. Um, so in fact, all the seven steps are geared towards reinforcing step one, because step one is the most important thing, being aware. Fundamentally, all the seven steps are to bring clarity uh, and you know that awareness in, in er every moment. So all the seven steps are geared towards an enforcing, reinforcing step one. Because step one of exercise one is the most fundable, fundamental and the most important one. It's a pivotal fulcrum around which the rest of the steps are hinged like the spikes of a wheel, finding its end at the axis of the wheel. This is what most traditions have talked about in different ways. Step one is very important and we have to be very firm on it. So we have to develop the capacity to be aware every moment without reaction. If you're firm in step one, then working with the higher steps become very simple and easy. So in this sense, the interplays of the seven steps only reinforces step one, which in turn bring clarity to the rest of the steps. Similarly, in exercise two up to step four, the basic idea is to study what is the status of the relationship and the transaction between the self and the body. Step one is just observing the self and the body. Step two is the transaction taking place between the self and the body. So information, the self is giving instruction to the body and the self is reading sensation from the body. So we are just observing the interplays of the self and the body in step two. In step three, the transaction is, you know, we are able to observe that the transaction is decided by the self and not by the body. We are able to see that it is the self which decides what instruction to give to the body and uh, the body does accordingly. Step four is the self is observing and the transaction uh, and being aware of the transaction is being done by the self. Step five, we are looking at the inner process which is taking place between the self and the body. But the major part is related to the process which is taking place at the level of self. 
So in step five, we are able to locate and identify the sanskars that are hidden deep down underneath our preconditioning and gross assumptions that is always triggering our reactions and responses to the world outside. In step six, we are trying to bring our, you know, bring about uh, when we are in reaction mode, what happens? When we are in response mode, what happens? So we are able to see that when we react, we are in a miserable condition. When we are respond, you know, when they are responding, then we are, you know, in a harmonious state within. <clears throat> Therefore, it suggests that if you want to be in harmony and happiness within, we have to ensure right feelings in any situation that I'm interacting with through the body. In step seven is that the self and the body are two different realities and it is in space in which they are situated and through space, they are connected to each other and uh, transacting. Uh, you know, with each other. So in a way, it is the sum up of the state of the body and self and the transaction taking place between the two. In doing so, in step seven, we are basically preparing ourselves to be able to see all these three things together, the self, the body, and the space. What the body and self and the space, you know, in which both the consciousness and material units are situated. The basic issue in exercise one and two is all about seeing things in its completeness, as I said earlier. So if you want to see the reality in its completeness, then I as the seer, I have to be at a place where it is possible to see things in its completeness. This is the basic point. So in order to see the reality in its completeness, my state of my own state of being has to evolve to a point where I can see the space and see all the activities taking place in space. Now, the only way to reach to that place from where things can be seen in its completeness is by being aware every moment. And through this awareness, I am reaching to a state of pure observer. Now, there I'm not sticking to the lower activities of the self, the imagination, I have moved up to the level of pure observer and at the level of pure observer, I'm able to see the gross most and the subtle most activities and the space. When I'm able to see that, I'm not swayed away by the lower activities of the self, the sanskar and the imagination. I'm able to see the self-organization. I'm able to see the harmony of every unit and its participation in the larger order and ultimately, uh, I'm able to see the coexistence. So if I am able to do this, I'm in a state of, you know, what you call, you know, state of samadhi or state of equanimity, uh, state of, you know, complete mindfulness from where I can see the whole existence in its completeness. And uh, I can also see my role in that whole existence. And therefore I can meaningfully um, participate and engage. This is what we mean by seeing the reality in its completeness. And the key to this is the first step, as I told earlier, to be aware every moment. This is the starting point, and this is what we are aiming at, to be aware all the time. When we are aware, we are able to see our feelings and because of our awareness every moment, we are able to ensure right feelings, uh, which leads to a harmony and happiness within. I'm clearly able to see that my happiness is my innate nature and it is not an influence from outside. Well, what I get from favorable conditions outside is only pleasant sensations, which can at the most lead to excitement, but not peace of mind. Uh, I may feel good when I get to eat what I like, when I get to wear what I like, but it can only give me some sensation, some pleasant feeling, but not peace of mind, not happiness, not exuberance, not bliss, not ecstasy. It can only give me some sensation, pleasant sensation though. 
So this is what we become, you know, fully aware of that things outside do not have the capacity to make me happy and peaceful, blissful, exuberant, unless I myself ensure right feelings and right thoughts. And my right feelings and right thoughts are not based on outside situations, but based on my clarity that my feeling is my choice, irrespective of what happens outside. My feeling is my responsibility. I have to ensure it. I have to nurture it, I have to fix it, and therefore I'm able, I'm responsible for it. The other is not responsible for my feeling that I have at the moment. So when I'm aware of my feelings every moment, and when I'm clear that I'm responsible for my feelings, I have no choice but to fix my feelings to ensure happiness within. That's the role of my natural acceptance. Therefore, my happiness is my responsibility. Only I and I and I can make myself happy, nothing else. Because my happiness and my peace are my responsibility. I have to ensure it. The problem today is, you know, that we are not working on ourselves. We live with the ideas which are intellectual, largely intellectual in nature. And we find that the ideas are wonderful, fantastic. And, um, and these ideas, we assume uh, uh, that these ideas mean uh, we have understood the reality. That's the, 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 the assumption. We have ideas and wonderful they are, and therefore we assume that we have understood the reality. But the fact is that we are not looking at the realities directly. Rather, we are entangled with the ideas. In order to understand ourselves, we must have to pay attention to ourselves. And unless we pay attention to ourselves, observe it directly, we won't understand it. So through the exercises one and two, we are trying to understand the self by directly observing it, looking at it directly. When we understand it, it will come to our living as well. But without paying attention to it directly, without seeing it, just accepting on the basis of our thought, it's not going to work. And that's the problem with the whole world. Um, when this happens, we will then live on the basis of body and talk about the consciousness, talk about the self, so on intellectually, without really understanding it with first person experience. After all these years of my practice, uh, you know, and especially going through these exercises for the last many months, you know, ever since this online, uh, you know, uh, uh, sessions, this satsang, this morning sessions uh, started, you know, uh, I haven't missed, uh, you know, uh, this time around, I, I missed some of the sessions because of other engagements, but otherwise, I've been full on, on, you know, hooked to this morning session, sharing wonderful experiences. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy the morning sessions. Uh, and because of these morning sessions, I'm able to be aware of myself relatively much better than before. I'm able to see my feelings most of the time. And the occasions getting influenced by events outside, you know, the, the frequency has drastically reduced. And so is my reaction to situations outside improved drastically. And, you know, uh, we, we, we are the measures. We, we ourselves can be the measure of, you know, whether we are transforming or not. How do we know whether we are transforming or not? Means we reduce our reactions, uh, you know, uh, influences from outside. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, is reducing and you are most of the time in, in uh, unfavorable conditions also, you are able to maintain your balance. That is one of the yardsticks to measure oneself, whether we are really transforming or not. Uh, when somebody shouts at you, when somebody you know, disapproves you, when somebody criticizes you, when somebody appreciates the other uh, more than you, if you are able to be uninfluenced by it, that means something, something wonderful is happening. So uh, I'm becoming mindful uh, of my feelings, 
which I'm inter you know, when I'm interacting with the world outside. Now, the frequency that I decide to turn in and be with myself and being aware of myself every moment is increasing each day. Being aware of myself consciously is leading to knowing oneself better. And surprisingly, knowing oneself is all about forgetting oneself and being selfless. And being selfless is to be aware of everything, that which is fundamentally by design in coexistence, harmony, and relationship. This is wonderful, really wonderful. Once I'm able to see that my feeling is my creation, I'm responsible for it. I'm able to see that I am both the culprit and the victim of my own feelings. I'm able to see that working within turning in, fixing my feelings is the only and only option available to me. No other options. If I'm aware enough, I'm able to see that it is not the behavior of the other person. The other may be misbehave, but it is not the behavior of the other person that is making me feel, making me feel miserable. But interestingly, it, you are able to see that it is my thought about the behavior of the other person that is making me feel miserable. You know, this is what, you know, UHP is, you know, in loud, uh, you know, ways uh, telling us. It is my thought about the behavior of the other person that is making me feel bad, irritated, angry, frustrated, not the behavior of the other person per se, it's our thought about the behavior. So now if we are checking on our thoughts and feelings, this evaporates. How I think and feel about the other person's behavior is solely my creation. When I'm able to see I am the creator, I am the master, I am the doer, I am the destiny, and my feelings and thoughts are independent of situations I'm able to see that I'm responsible for my feelings. I have no choice but to commit myself towards being with myself every moment, being with my feelings every moment. When I'm able to see that my natural acceptance is my guide to happiness through right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts. And on the other hand, when I'm able to see that my unhappiness is because of my gross assumption that I am the body, my gross assumption that my happiness is outside, I have no choice but to work for right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts and the competence for right living with the world outside. Therefore, the word commitment becomes only a term to describe my way of life, my worldview. Now, it is not even a commitment. It is a way of life because I don't see another option to commit to, but to work within. That's the only way, full time, no matter who I am and what I am doing. For my happiness, I'm able to see that it is only and only right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts, no other alternatives. Therefore, no other commitments because there is no other way of being happy other than right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts. When I'm clear that right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts and the competence to coexist with the world outside is the only way out. I also become clear about my participation in the larger order. And my participation includes my competence to live with harmony and my participation towards social responsibility by ensuring right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts in oneself. And also to strive to facilitate right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts in others. Because I'm now able to see that that's the only way. I have no choice left with me. So once we are able to see right understanding, right feelings and right thoughts as the only source of our happiness, then it is the only pursuit to pursue happiness within and not without. And thus, this is the only commitment left for us. You just have to see that your happiness is your responsibility when you have the clarity, now you are left with no other choice but to pursue it within. So turning in is the only way out, as Sadhguruji very clearly says, you know, turning is in is the only way out. And this is very true.
and uh, I, I really feel uh, very fortunate to have come across, uh, you know, UHP, Ganesh Ji, Rajul Ji, Sharmila Ji, Kumar Sambhav Ji, uh, you know, thank you all, you know, uh, accepting me as part of this UHP team. I remain ever indebted to this, uh, you know, wonderful encounter and, uh, you know, uh, many more wonderful discoveries ahead, I wish. So I think uh, this is all that I have got to share. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. And if there are questions, I'll be more than happy to attend to it. Uh, you know, Not that I would have all the answers to whatever you, uh, you ask me, but it will be a pleasure to listen to your questions, if any. Thank you, Sharmila Ji, and thank you. Um, I do not know whether Ganesh Ji is around, but I pay my you know, homage and respect Charan Sparsh from Bhutan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lumtanji. That was nice. Uh, you recapped uh, <clears throat> the whole content also very nicely. Um, so thank you very much. You are welcome, uh, yeah. Rajanji. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Lumtanji. Thank you. Thank you, Sharmila ji. Thank you. That was very beautiful. And you're, um, I'm sure many people were very inspired with your, uh, you know, valuable insights to your, you know, what you shared today. And uh, I think uh, there are a few hands raised. So we'll directly go to that. Uh, KP Singh ji, you wanted to share something? Um, ji, sabhi ko namaste, Lungtan ji. Namaste ji, namaste. Namaste. Uh, I'm mesmerized. Um, I, uh, I, I'm so mesmerized that many times I lost um, myself. Um, as Rajul Bhaiya said, um, I think in few minutes, um, uh, Lungtanji has put the complete UHV uh, very, very succinctly. Um, and, and I think this is something that I want to listen over and over again. Um, uh, my request would be that this sharing uh, be made available because Particularly, uh, I'm sure it'll be uh, the similar feeling from many of us. But for me, it appeared as if uh, everything that I have, I've been uh, listening to, learning from many, many months, has been just put before me in in, in just 20, 25 minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Lungtenji. I was missing you actually uh, from last few months. Because I have, I, have, uh, I have heard you, your wisdom so much in last few months, um, but this time I was missing you. I'm so fortunate that uh, that I could hear you, and I think many uh, others who were not present in previous uh, sessions they would have uh, benefited a lot tremendously. So uh, a request is to Rajul Bhaiya that this sharing be. Uh, made available somewhere where we can uh, go over this over and over again. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, K.P. Singh Ji, for your you know nice uh, words. It's always a pleasure. I have been listening, attending this session, uh, but uh, because this session was you know meant for the new. Um, participants, so I, I was keenly attending, listening most of the time so i didn't uh, engage uh, you know directly just to give this opportunity to others and and learn from their sharing thank you thank you thank you ji um, somani ji i think would like to say something sunil somani ji ji namaste Yes. Namaste, Lungtanji. Namaste, Sabhiko. Namaste, Ji. Namaste. Ji. Uh, 
it's really nice to hear you after a long time because in last uh, uh, particular discussions and last time when we started up the session with uh, ganesh ji this time uh, ganesh ji has given this responsibility to sharmila didi and kumar bhaiya they are doing very well but yes yes the, the discussions uh, definitely uh, this time we missed you along with some other uh, very uh, good co explorers was missing and uh, to hear today and uh, really it's wonderful that in a very less time maybe of say 25 to 30 minutes you are able to brief about both the exercises and uh, apart from this the basic crux of uh, uhv also you discussed in very short and sweet way to all of uh, the co explorers thank you very much and uh, your inputs and discussion basically last time uh, we, which you had discussed was very fruitful and i still can recall those discussions and i wish that uh, you uh, participate uh, though the newcomers are the new co explorers uh, shall be given chance but in between if uh, something uh, very fruitful comes it will be helpful to everybody thank you thank you lankan ji thank you very thank much. you thank you ji yes maybe we can take one more observation before it is time for the hindi session uh, but before we do that i will just uh, request uh, for um, um 19th onwards uh, those of you who would be willing to share your um, you know learnings from exercise 1 and 2 kindly put your names in the chat and uh, we can firm it up so we have uh, anuradha ji for tomorrow but after that those of you who would like to share uh, please uh, put your uh, name and your tentative date for sharing so that we can have the schedule firmed up for the next few days uh, yes shivdasan ji namaste namaste shivdasan Na Uh, the entire UHV team and welcome, uh, Lubtan Ji. Namaste, Shivda Sanjee. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and it's our privilege and proud privilege and pleasure to listen again and again to you. Listening to you today, I got a, a reinforcement to what I learned in exercise, picked up in exercise one and two. and got a lot of positive vibration spiritual vibe listening to you thank you i just wanted to ask you um one clarification in fact a lot of things uh, is has accumulated and precipitated in my mind to ask you but you know time is the limit i will ask you limited into one question or one or two that as an external person uh um uh, to um a uh, buddhism uh what i understand buddhism is a light and wisdom and it it's complete in itself in helping us leading a life connecting to divinity and merging with the what you call space or existence it is complete now you are the scholar you are a monk of buddhism and all of you now uh what is that do you find any gap in introducing uhv in buddhist establishments like don't you find any opposition there like you know i believe buddhism is complete and as a light and a wisdom in leading a life connecting to divinity merging with uh, existence or eternity and all the things so where is the gap you find in the dues uhp in such establishment this is the question number 
and if time permits i will ask you after listening to you uh, thank you thank you lumtenchi love to listen yeah. to you yeah uh, thank you shiv dasanchi that's a, that's a very good uh, uh, question uh, if you if you look at uh, you know what the buddha uh, you know propagated 2000 you know 600 almost years ago he 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 said uh, you know do not accept my words for the sake of uh, you know accepting it out of devotion and belief but examine my words so that itself shows that buddhism is open ended you know exploration uh, first person based inquiry uh, investigation but unfortunately over the years like any other traditions of the world now this explorative approach you know slowly over the years turns into a conservative uh, you know um, approach and they begin to perform it like uh, like a ritual that's the problem that's the problem and if when people do this then anything that comes outside of buddhism people will you know have resistance but people who are open minded who are explorative in their approach uhb is the legs with which we can walk the concepts of buddhism you know it's all about understanding it's all about the feelings and uhb is you know clearly talking about this right understanding right feelings and right thoughts these are the only source of our you know inner well being so if people are open minded you know uhp is a wonderful tool uhp can you know not only to buddhism uhp can be applied to any tradition of the world hinduism um, you know islam and christianity uh, if the, the only thing is people have to be open minded explorative in nature investigative you know in nature and try to understand it logically scientifically rationally then the, i don't see there is any gap but the moment you take any tradition as you know as a ritual then there is no room for outside interventions that's true with any other tradition so I, in a nutshell this is what i would say and if in in bhutan you know there are people you know uh, if if there were some you know open minded people listening to my sharing today from bhutan they would they would really see that this is buddhism you know this is not uhp they would even say because uhp is universal uh, verifiable scientific in nature and this is what buddha wanted uh, you know made it very clear right from the beginning so in a nutshell this is what i would say there are people who are open minded they you know go for it they you know and uh, you know but then at the same time there are also people who would like to think oh uhp must be hinduism uhp must be something coming from outside uh, why do we want it so it depends uh, you know on on where the explorers stand in their journey of transformation very true very true 